This is where I'm supposed to say I had three videos to show you in my sermon today. <laughs> now, actually, I'm very fortunate. God's providence. Uh, no videos this morning, so it works out well. But let us pray. Lord Jesus, give us the vision to see you when you come into our lives. Help us to be patient with your elusive presence. Preserve us from trying to figure you out on our terms, but help us to be hospitable and receive you on your terms. And when at last you speak to us, help us to respond to your voice, to answer when you call our name, and then to follow you where you lead. In your holy name we pray. Amen. John 3 verse 16 is the most famous verse in all of Scripture. I don't know if that's actually true, but it feels that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it's famous, I think we imagine that we understand what it means. We imagine our minds have unlocked the mystery. But the truth is, the more I have come to understand who God is and the Word of God, the deeper the mystery gets. I want to dive into the mystery of John 3 this morning with you by starting with this strange story that Jesus references in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, what is he talking about? The story comes from Numbers 21. The Israelites are working their way in the desert around the Red Sea south of Edom as they are escaping from Egypt. And they're staying south of Edom, one would presume, to avoid a fight with the Edomites. But of course, by going south, they take the long route to the promised land. And the people get impatient with this long route and they start complaining against God and Moses. Why are we out here, they say. Why did we leave Egypt just to die? The food stinks, the accommodations are lousy. What were we thinking? The Lord then sends poisonous snakes among the people, which bite the people and many of them died. The people then confess, we've been belly aching so much, Moses, and we're sorry. Please go to God and tell him we're sorry and ask him to drive these poisonous snakes away from us. So Moses intercedes. And he prays to God and God says, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at the serpent on the pole and live. So Moses crafts a bronze serpent and he sets it on the pole and the people get bit and they look at it and they live. The end. What a fascinating story, right? Interesting. I have like a million questions about what's going on in this story, but I thought I would focus on two of them that jumped out at me in this particular reading through the week. The first question was like this, or focuses around this idea. The people ask God to get rid of the snakes. They say to themselves and to God, our problem is the snakes. And so they go to Moses and they say, please ask God to drive away these snakes that are biting us and killing us. And you know what? I'm not sure they're wrong. Right? If, I were be, if we were all being bit by poisonous snakes, I would be looking to drive the snakes away. Get rid of them. But God doesn't drive the snakes away. Why? Why does God let the snakes stay? 
Instead of driving the snakes away, the story ends with the snakes still being there. They're still biting the people. But instead, we get the second point or question that I have about this particular story. God uses a symbol of the problem as a part of the solution to the problem. Why? Why does God do this? Snake bite victims stare at a bronze snake and then they live. It's almost as if God is saying, you don't need to drive the problem away to solve it. You need to take the problem further in to solve it. It's as if God is saying, the problem is part of the solution. Now that's interesting to me. And now when you pull back from that story and you start to look at John 3.16 again, you find a whole new vision that starts to appear. To solve the problem of sin and death, separation and isolation from God, we need to look at the very thing that frightens us most, which is death. Separation and isolation from God. And we not only need to look at it, we need to take it into our lives. And only then will we live. John 3 tells us that the Son of Man is lifted up. And the Son of Man is the symbol of the problem. The Son of Man is the image of our sin and death lifted up before us. Our hatred of God, our hatred of others, and maybe even our hatred of ourselves. And we are called to look at and believe in this Son of Man. Now, I like the idea of believing in Jesus, which I think means for us that we're to take Him into our life. It's not just that we stare at the cross and imagine magically that we'll get better. It's not even that we stare at the cross and imagine that we can come up with the right thoughts, the proper doctrines, the right way to think about who Jesus is, and then magically we're better. No, to believe in, to take Jesus in, means that we trust and faith follow and live the way that Jesus lived. To take Jesus in is to repeat the words of Paul in Galatians for ourselves. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. To take him in means to change something significant about us. About what we trust, how we live, and who we follow in our lives. Now, on Wednesday nights, we've been reading this group, reading this book as a part of our Wednesday night group. It's, calling, it's called Falling Upward. It's a funny title, right? Falling Upward by Richard Rohr. And a few weeks ago, he offered this particular piece in the, the chapter that we were reading. And it kind of per perplexed me, but I understand it a little better now and I wanted to share it with you. He wrote, Judeo-Christianity includes the problem inside the solution and as part of the solution. The genius of the biblical revelation 
is that it refuses to deny the dark side of things, but forgives failure and integrates falling to achieve its only promised wholeness. Now those first parts of that reading make sense to me and I can kind of incorporate them. It's the last words that really perplex me. To integrate falling into our lives is the only way to receive the promised biblical wholeness. I think that what that means is that the snakes aren't driven away. They're taken in. The sin, failure, darkness, and death that the cross symbolizes isn't driven away. But in Jesus Christ, they're taken in. There's something going on there that says that we don't just simply push and drive away our failures. We must draw them closer into our lives to fall upward. Something's going on there. It's perplexing and interesting. Now you all know that we have a new dog in our house, right? His name is Jax. I've talked about him in sermons before. This past week, we took Jax for his second vet appointment. Right? He was all excited and happy. And in this appointment, he received another round of shots. Uh, dog's favorites, shots. And these were vaccinations to prevent diseases for the dog. Now hopefully, we've all had these kinds of vaccinations. Not dog vaccinations, you're not worried about getting those diseases, right? But human vaccinations, right? Where we take in a weakened or even dead form of the problem so that when the time comes, our bodies might be built up to fight the real problem? You see, the problem is inside the solution. As part of the solution, we find this spelled out in Scripture in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 to 10. He says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always, now listen to Paul's words here, because they're pretty profound. Always carrying in our body the death of Jesus. so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. We take death into us through Jesus to vaccinate us against the power of death when we face the real thing. You notice that, right? You all are going to die. I don't know if that's news for you this morning. But you're going to die. God doesn't drive the central problem of our life away. He incorporates the problem into the solution. So we are baptized into the death of Christ so that we might be raised with Christ. What a mysterious view of the sheer audacity of the gospel. Who would dare to face their problems, actually look at them with unveiled eyes, and then take them into yourself 
to acknowledge that this is who I am and this is what I struggle with. Who would do that? It's a no wonder that we rely fully and wholly on the grace of God. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Pastor Rodney, I mean, death on the cross, new life and resurrection, that's what we're all about, yeah. We face that problem, we're honest about that. But really, let's do it, let's, let's make it concrete. Let's make it real. Can we all acknowledge that racism is a problem in our country? Do, do we have a problem with racism in the United States? Yeah, of course we do. How many here this morning are racist? It's interesting, isn't it? Right? Have you ever met somebody who says, yes, I'm racist? I've never met a racist in my